The topic is Marcus Garvey and Africans in the Caribbean. And we have with us to uh, talk about Marcus Garvey and uh, Africans who made up a very, very significant part of the uh, international slave trade in that particular part of the world, uh, Dr. Al-Hadid, who is the chairperson of the Africana Studies Department uh, at uh, Tennessee State University. Uh, Dr. Al-Hadid, uh, the uh, individual countries that we are talking about and uh, the uh, uh, European countries that established these, uh, these uh, particular areas in the Caribbean, uh, these countries uh, were responsible in a real sense for what is known as the uh, international slave trade. Uh, give us some information in reference to the operation of, these, uh, of this trade and how Africans reacted to uh, being enslaved in this particular part of the country. Absolutely. Before we go forward in that direction, let's go back to the continent and see how things unfolded. Mm -hmm. I want to say something briefly about the Moors in Spain mm -hmm. from 711 to 1492. And then when they were pushed out of Spain, and also when the Sudanic Empire, which was the third Sudanic Empire in Songhai, fell, Christopher Columbus then went out and he did his explorations in October of 1492. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning mm -hmm. of uh, the Ma'afa or the Holocaust for mm -hmm. African Americans throughout the world. Mm -hmm. So all of these avaricious European powers, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, mm -hmm. uh, the British, the Germans, Good. Mm -hmm. uh, they started taking initiatives to go around the world. Uh, established colonies, go mm -hmm. into Africa and kidnap people, mm -hmm. uh, foment uh, mm -hmm. wars so that they could get prisoners of wars and they brought mm -hmm. them over here. So it created what is known as this period of primitive accumulation. Mm -hmm. And this is the period that laid the foundation mm -hmm. for capitalism mm -hmm. as we know it. Mm -hmm. Now before, in the beginning of the slave trade, they were just concerned about getting human labor power mm -hmm. and then taking that human labor power to the colonists to go into the mines and bring out the gold and mm -hmm. the silver and do the agriculture to produce the cotton and the tea and those type of things. And at that particular time, it was not so much a matter of them uh, using an ideology to talk about the inferiority mm -hmm. of a people. But once this trade became lucrative, mm -hmm. and also once they had the white indentures over here, mm -hmm. they had to draw a clear line of demarcation between the white indentures mm -hmm. who were enslaved for a specified period of time mm -hmm. and the Africans who were enslaved as chattel mm -hmm. for life. For life. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the ideology of racism started to develop. So mm -hmm. once uh, uh, slavery created capitalism mm -hmm. and then the ideology of racism started to develop. Mm -hmm. And what I would argue as a sociologist is that uh, capitalism, a form of economics, mm -hmm. created the ideology of racism. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that the Europeans had this negative attitude about mm -hmm. Africans because they had almost 800 years of experience with the Moors. They mm -hmm. knew in the Greek and Roman time, they knew about the ancient Egyptians. So they knew that the people in Africa were highly civilized and highly developed. Mm -hmm. But they had to create this mythology so that to keep the white workers who were mm -hmm. indentured mm -hmm. uh, controlling mm -hmm. their um, uh, plantations in their interest while they were running their royal families and feudalism in Europe, you see. And so this developed and then eventually you created a situation in this country where you had the people divided uh, mm -hmm. along, you know, lines of race mm -hmm. and also lines of class. Now when the American Revolution took place in 1776, mm -hmm. of course, there was some talk about, you know, we hold these truths to be mm -hmm. self-evident, all yeah. men are created mm -hmm. equal, but that really didn't apply to the Africans Good. because those that carried out the American Revolution intended to establish another white nation. Mm -hmm. They were not about the business of creating freedom for the chattel slaves. Mm -hmm. So they kept our people in bondage for almost another hundred years mm -hmm. and basically had to fight another civil war mm -hmm. in order to bring that resolution about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and so Marcus Garvey, uh, uh, when you think in terms of uh, his career, exactly how would you uh, introduce him into uh, this particular mix of Africans in the Caribbean? I mean, what yes. was distinctive about Garvey that might have separated him perhaps from a, uh, a Toussaint Leover to uh, some of the other individuals who played significant roles in uh, African American history? Absolutely. Uh, Garvey, we'd have to start with the Berlin Conference of 1884-85. Mm -hmm. Now the scramble for African captives had ended the Europeans have become entrenched in Africa. Now mm -hmm. they are establishing colonies in Africa, mm -hmm. they're establishing colonies in Angola, Nigeria, and so forth, and basically enslaving Africans on African soil. On the continent. On the it's continent it's itself. Mm -hmm. So by this time, Garvey is born uh, August 17, 1887. Mm -hmm. 
and Jamaica is colonized, where he was born in St. Anne's, uh, Jamaica. And so when we look at Garvey, I would see Garvey almost as the reincarnation mm -hmm. of a Toussaint Louverture, mm -hmm. because Toussaint Louverture, Dessalines, and Bookman carried out the Haitian Revolution in 1804. Mm -hmm. So Garvey now is coming almost 100 years later mm -hmm. to bring about a similar type agitation, you see, mm -hmm. in Jamaica, which mm -hmm. is not that far, you know, from, mm -hmm. from, uh, from, uh, from Haiti and mm -hmm. from the Cuba, Hispanic, all the areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of Gavi, Gavi uh, was a person that uh, who's was from a father who mm -hmm. was a maroon mm -hmm. in Jamaica. Uh, his father taught him a lot about history, about culture. Mm -hmm. uh, he worked as a period of time as a printer, and mm -hmm. then he started traveling mm -hmm. throughout the Caribbean. He traveled throughout South America. He mm -hmm. went to Venezuela. He went to Panama. He went to Ecuador. Throughout the world mm. and everywhere he looked mm -hmm. he said where's the black man's land mm -hmm. where's the black man's mm -hmm. government his men of big affairs mm -hmm. and he said since he could not find them he would set out himself mm -hmm. to create this mm -hmm. and so he left um, the Caribbean, and mm -hmm. then he went to London mm -hmm. uh, around 1912 while in London he had um, contact with a man by the name of Duse Muhammad Ali mm -hmm. Pasha who was a, an Egyptian um, nationalist mm -hmm. of Sudanese origin. Mm -hmm. And he worked with Dusay for Mohammed for about two or three years with his um, newspaper, the uh, London Times Oriental Review. Mm -hmm. And he learned a lot about nationalism. He learned a lot mm -hmm. about Pan-Africanism. So Dusay Mohammed was actually his mentor. And then he started, developed a motto for his movement. It was one God, one aim, and mm -hmm. one destiny. Mm -hmm. And Garvey started crying, said, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. Very mm -hmm. interesting, however. Mm -hmm. Garvey really got sparked mm -hmm. from his experience with Dusay Muhammad and mm -hmm. also from reading Up From Slavery mm -hmm. by Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he tried several times to come to the United States to meet uh, Booker T. Washington because mm -hmm. he felt that Booker T. Washington was the only black man in America that had good sense. He was the only one that had a good understanding mm -hmm. how to bring about uh, a solution. Because mm -hmm. Garvey was not interested in assimilation. He was not interested in integration. Mm -hmm. He was interested in self-determination. He was mm -hmm. interested in nation building. And what he saw at, in the experiment in Tuskegee is that uh, George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington was actually laying a mm -hmm. foundation mm -hmm. for the infrastructure building a nation. And mm -hmm. that's why he was eager to meet mm -hmm. Booker T. Washington. Unfortunately, when he got to this country, and, in 1916, mm -hmm. uh, Booker D. Washington had passed in 1915. Uh, Very good. Mm -hmm. And of course, Dr. Allardy, let's make preparations for this uh, second commercial break, after which we'll come back and give you an opportunity to uh, talk about Marcus Garvey and his influence in these uh, particular areas. And we'll be back with you uh, following this very, very short uh, commercial break. Hi. The topic is Marcus.